Hi, welcome to Power at the Podcast. My name is Valentin Sandoval, and I'll be your host alongside Don Shapiro, owner of the actual building here at 1931 Myrtle. Power at the Podcast is an idea that we had for some time now in terms of Don's contacts in the business world on an international level, really. But here in El Paso, he's been a legendary figure for, for generations upon generations. And, and so he and I coming together for one, me to author his book. Out of that, we started a marketing company, I guess you can call it. But it's more of a content creation based mechanism where we utilize storytelling, journalism and marketing to help them develop their brand and, and their online social media presence and the ethos of what it is that they're presenting and the value proposition and things of that nature. With that being said, you know, we figured that part of a communications company would be to start a podcast and, and where we talk to political figures, business figures, we talk to anybody that is really working at defining their destiny and their place in, in this life here in El Paso and why it's a very complex area, very layered area, very huge area and a very charismatic area. So in that, we'll talk to, to different artisans, media makers, content creation artists, visionaries and writers. I'll bring that component to the podcast. So. With that being said, our first guest is Emma Schwartz, who is El Paso Inc.'s 2017 Person of the Year. And she really is a dynamic, you know, brilliant person. And we're very lucky that she decided to bring her vision here to El Paso. And what a vision it is. It's as big as it gets. It's international. And reading from the website here, and, and essentially, the Medical Center of the Americas Foundation is transforming the Paso del Norte region by creating a world-class life sciences hub in the heart of El Paso, Texas. And for those of us that are from here, you know, it's that brand new building that's off of the Reynolds exit, off the I-10, right next to Texas Tech Medical Center. So that whole area within the next 20 to 30 to 50 years really is gonna be completely transformed. And I think it'll really take El Paso's uh, place on in terms of biomedical industry and the medical industry into, into an international spectrum. And Emma's really just an overall really cool person. I've known her for a few years now and I've had the, the, the wonderful opportunities to, to work with her and, and produce content for the MCA on different occasions. In doing so, I get to explore just, you know, some of the region's most brilliant minds, you know, the younger minds that are that are doing some amazing stuff in the sciences and the different research work. And she's bringing different El Pasoans that are you know, out and about in the, you know, different cities but they want to come back home and bring their expertise and their education to El Paso. And so she's one of the ones that can provide those opportunities for really high-ended scientists and inventors and entrepreneurs. We're really excited to have her here as our first guest. And again, welcome. I wanted to talk about you know a little bit of the history that you have gone with Essie Levine, her, her mother, and talk about how you guys met. How did that happen? When did she come to your building that we're in right now? The first time she met, she was, I think she was married at the time. Oh. When we met? Or when you met my mom? When I met your mom. Yes, I think she was still married, yes. And that was in the uh, early 70s. And... Um, Le I think it was the mid-80s. Oh, mid-80s. Yes. We started in, around the mid-70s. Mm -hmm. And she um, met me and uh, came in, I met her for the first time when she came by the building and uh, the receptionist and the people that I knew, we always had a totally open door to everybody, an open door, especially to our workers. And it always worked and a lot of times they happened to bring your mother in, introduced us and I was delighted to meet her. But they didn't worry about appointments or not, I always had an open door to any ideas or any people that I wanted to uh, that want to see me. And it's almost still that way with some reservations. But so your mom came in and told me we have a uh, plant. She has a plant in Juarez, sewing plant, and uh, she's just getting it started. And she was just doing sample lines at the time, and I said, uh, we'd love to see it. And my uh, so my production guy was Ken Westmoreland, who was extremely good at what he did. And I introduced him and I said, we're gonna go over there and look at her plant. We went over there together and she had a small plant doing <clears throat> samples, but she told me what her 
what she wanted, what her potential was. And uh, and Wes Merlin and I spoke about it, and we decided to, just on the spot, we gave her a contract for several months to take everything she produced. And she did very well, but she was short on money every Friday on uh, the day to pay the workers in Juarez. She would come over and we'd pay her everything owed. And I didn't know it until recently, but she then went back to Juarez to pay the workers and came back to El Paso where she lived. That was our first startup and we've been friends ever since. Well, I can't thank you enough for those days because you helped her get her start. And it's really tough for a woman who um, was new in the industry and starting off and I think about to be newly single with three little kids. And right. the part of that story that you didn't know until today was that we were usually tagging along with her in the car <laughs> when she would come here to pick up that money and then take us back to Wattis to pay everybody. And uh, so when I pulled up to your building today, I was flooded with memories of growing up and sitting in the back of a hot truck and great El Paso heat waiting for mom to do her business. I think, um, as I mentioned, you, you asked, why didn't she bring you in? And I think she was trying so, to... I love you. <laughs> she was trying to be the most professional woman she could to make sure she could do business and provide for her she family. She kept the kids in the car without me knowing about <laughs> Today she'd be in jail, but back then, it's the way we did business, you know? It's the way things were done. <laughs> Great story. Yeah, yeah. She's a hard worker. Thank you. Thanks for, for giving her that, that start. It's... Um, you know, I think you're doing it again here, trying to help artists get their start. It's really, exactly. it's really hard Every to day. get started. Yeah, yeah, and you're also starting a new industry here, so doubly hard. Um, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. Power at the Pass. Power at the Pass. Which is also the name of the book we're almost complete on. Yeah. Same name, Power at the Pass. And the way we, we got that, it used to be, years ago it was, El Paso was the Paso del Norte, the pass to the north. Yeah. And um, we decided that it's got to be here. Forget about the passage history. Yeah. The past, part of the past is here and now for yeah. us and the city yeah. and the artists yeah. and the people and especially the young ones. Right. When I first met Don at a city magazine party and I was in transition trying to figure out what I was going to do, whether stay in town or, mm -hmm. or take a, an opportunity elsewhere. I met Bobby, his wife, first. she came up to me and she asked me, what do I do? And I told her, I'm a writer. And she tells me, it's funny because my husband's looking for a writer. And I, I go meet Don for the first time and he tells me that I was, he had two other writers prior to talking to me. And these guys were a Harvard grad and, and they worked in Beverly Hills. And they, they worked with his uncle, Carl Reiner, so mm -hmm. they're seasoned writers. But Don just wasn't feeling what they were writing. It just mm -hmm. there wasn't. It wasn't resonating, and, yeah. and so we they didn't read my meet my standards. Yeah, I mean, and, and so, so I came in the next week to meet with him. It was, it was on a Thursday or Friday, so I come in Monday morning, and I come with material. I come with articles I've written. I come mm -hmm. with a copy of my book. They yeah. come with this author's book award, and and I give it to him, and we started talking, and, and I think immediately there was a connection. That this was going to lead to something, and mm -hmm. I wasn't too crazy about the idea of ghostwriting just because I wasn't crazy about it. You know, I want to write my second book, my book. And, yeah. and so he gave me the manuscript that was written. And there, there was parts of it that were pretty decent, about 140 pages. And I think like half of that was good research and the rest mm -hmm. of it was just bad writing. You know? wow. and, and and so I, I signed on to it and he hired me, you know, within the next like, two, three days or about a week, actually. It took him about a week. And then and then from that point on, it just became an obvious to I tell Don, I said, look, Don, I'm, I'm a filmmaker. My, my, my trade, my craft, my core competency is... Is, is telling the story visually. But Why you told me that before I even heard you, but it also uh, made it exciting, the fact that he was a writer and a filmmaker, and I could see a whole great happening combined, and we're in the middle of it right now, the happening grows daily. Yeah, absolutely, so it was a natural time. If I'm gonna interview Paul Foster, if I'm gonna interview, you know, your mom, Ceci Levine, if I'm gonna interview Charlie Crowder, mm -hmm. interview Jaime, Jaime Bermudez, why not shoot it? Why yeah. not let me take a camera and let me augment it for mm -hmm. posterity, for one, mm -hmm. and secondly, you build, maybe I can build a documentary out of this, or 
much more than a documentary, maybe a series. Maybe mm -hmm. I can tell like a, we a web series. And and so it became a natural where, you know, I wrote a proposal for Don and Don looked at it and, and he realized that we can start a company off of this. And and though Don's, you know, business action West was patent manufacturing, mm -hmm. a lot of it was PR and marketing. You know, he's a natural mm -hmm. at marketing. It's in a second nature to him. Because, I mean, he used to have trade shows in Las Vegas and Los mm -hmm. Angeles and New York. And so, you know, entertainment and fashion was part of his background. It was a natural to look at video, media, and film mm -hmm. to become the next, uh, potentially next industry, the way he was instrumental in patent and manufacturing in El Paso and why this is biggest uh, business boom. Right. Now Very true. Is, it went way beyond writing a book. It's building another industry. Yes. Growing fast. And we are in the middle of it right now. And it's just as exciting as the gene industry was years ago. Which is how your mother and I met the <laughs> gene maker. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Making genes is art is an art too. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It was, so it's been a it's been a, a tremendous ride. It's been yeah. fun every day, isn't it? It's excitement. There's something that occurs, and we, we're never short of of being put forth with a challenge. And and then you have to find a solution. You have to network. You have to find a way to. How do you bring in? What does it mean when when movies and media being an industry here? What does that really mean, right? And there's ways that, for example, right now I'm getting the call from a producer from Phoenix that we're working on a documentary project with this fighter who is a gold medalist and he won the UFC flyweight championship. So we're constructing for them uh, a, a teaser and a documentary project. So he wants to open up a, a office here in, in Don's building, but like a virtual office. So whenever he's in town, he's got a space here at Power mm -hmm. at the Pass because he loves what's going on here. You know, sure. he has a studio up there. It's, on, it's right on campus, ASU campus. Mm -hmm. and, but what he loves about this is the fact that it's in a warehouse district. It's got the, what a real, a, a, a studio for the most part is like a canvas. You know, when you go to downtown Los Angeles, on the outskirts, you have places like this. They become warehouse workspaces for creatives. Right, right outside, we have a friend of mine uh, from El Paso, but he's in Los Angeles with his clothing line and he creates his own content. So he's having different MCs come and put his clothes on while, while they'll cipher and they'll present and he'll shoot that. And he creates the marketing for his product line that way. So it's like a creative warehouse that always has activity going on. So the point of it is to, is to on the mic, macro and the micro, to create industry for, for people that are already working and then you start to build uh, an ecosystem around that, interns and assistants, and, and you see that you're not dependent on uh, tax breaks from from Texas to come down and bring in the studios because that's yeah, that's a whole different story. You know, you you look at, for ways to build from ground up, utilizing technology and utilizing the community. You know, we build from within. Absolutely, we don't need the grants. We don't need the politics. No, we need nothing but creative people. Yeah. And great businesses. And good support. I, I would say that exactly. you, you can't buy people to come to a great, place. Right? And if they come there, they're not going to stay. So you need to create an environment that they want to be in. Exactly. And so it's kind of like you've created an art incubator here in a way. When uh, Dr. Natalisa came to visit us about eight months ago, for some reason podcasts are really big in communications when it's really just this, a radio station for the Internet. Yeah. You know, where you can be a little bit more poignant and be yourself. She liked that. And and secondly, we brought in a friend of ours from, he's from El Paso, but he works with Adobe, the, so the biggest software company mm -hmm. in the world. He teaches different programs and he's got shops in Houston and Dallas and Austin, and he's been able to thrive elsewhere. He wanted to do it here, but he was way too ahead of his time, you know, 10 years ahead of his time. So right. he left a little malcontent with El Paso. Yeah. So I've been trying to convince him to come yep. back. I'm like, it's a different El Paso now than yeah. it was. 10, 15 years ago. And, and so he came in and, and he to meet up with Natalicio so that they can, so that we can bring the adult, the big A to El Paso yeah. in one way, shape, or form, even if it's two, three jobs at first, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, it's a start. Smart's small, but it grows. Absolutely. It grows. If and, you fertilize it, you got it. You got to work it. It never gets easy. When we had spoken to you earlier on in the year or last year, for our documentary project, we interviewed you, and that was really, uh, really great. Thank you for that. I've noticed now it's in a different phase. You know, like the hotel went down. You know, you start to see like this transformation becoming more and more evident. It's crazy how much is happening on the campus. I thought it would take. You know, we we had a 50-year master plan, 
And I think that plan will um, basically be built out, I'd say more like in 30 years. So, you know, and that was based on looking at other academic medical campuses and how they've grown over time and averaging it. Um, but I think as a community, we've all come together um, from UTEP and Texas Tech to the private sector, the medical device manufacturing, William Beaumont Army Medical Center, every really, everyone investing in the same vision to, to bring a medical industry here, a high-level me- medical industry. And, um, and we have the talent. We just didn't really have a vision. Once you put that vision together, you back it with a lot of different resources um, and it's flourishing. It's exciting to see. And I think, you know, it's a great model. You're, you guys are doing similar things. And, um, you know, I'm born and raised in El Paso. So it's great to see um, what I knew in my heart was that we have the talent. We have the capability. We just were, were, we were lacking something. And we found it. What do you, what do you think that was, Emma? What do you think that, that, that void was, that lack, you know, throughout the years? You know, I talk about it a little bit in terms of self-confidence. It's like huh. we, we lacked self-confidence That's as true. a community. That's a good point. Yeah. 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 Don says that in general. Yeah. We're talking about they that. They have an yeah. inferiority complex. We, they don't yeah. realize what a powerhouse they have to build with. Absolutely. I'd go all over it's the it's changing. Yes, it's changing. But I'd go all over the world and meet El Pasoans doing phenomenal things, phenomenal True. jobs. It's thinkers, happening right now. Leaders. But these are people all over the world. Just the beginning. But, but they were born here. They were born and raised here. So there was just something missing to keep that talent here. I know we have the talent. Um, and now it's starting to stick. People are starting to come back. People who aren't from here are starting to come and um, embrace this as their home. So it's it's a completely different place. I left El Paso twice and swore I would never come back both times. <laughs> where, so did you, where did you go? Where did you go? <laughs> California both times, right? <laughs> where, um, where, where, where in California? Well, the first time I went to, to Stanford for my undergrad, and um, who wouldn't want to leave, like leave El Paso for right. that? And never thought I'd move back, but I did move back, and I had a, you know, got a tremendous opportunity here in El Paso that I could have never gotten living in Silicon Valley, competing with every other PhD that's there. Every you know, everyone's got a PhD up there. Everyone was a software developer. Everyone was starting up some major software. So I came here, and the support network here got me an amazing job at the hospitals here. I got mentored um, and I really got moved up the chain to where it was huge for my career. But eventually I was like, yeah, you know, still young and crazy and got to get back to California. Left to Los Angeles to get my master's and work out there for years. And it was great. But, you know, reflecting on what I've been able to do here and the number of people who have helped me do what we've done here, you can't you can't. Um, Pull that out of thin air in Los Angeles. That's a great point. Yeah, I hear. And I think it's only the beginning. Yeah. What we're seeing now, because yeah. I was talking to a friend of mine, a lot of the business people have been very critical about the city and the government and everything that's happening. We were talking, and um, he said, you know, it's, I'm very impressed. Things are really happening right now more than ever, yeah. and the future will be great. I said, I totally agree with you. It only took 100 years <laughs> to get us where we are. I know. But, you know, it's, it's interesting about, about government. And I, um, you know, we need the support of our government. But what it took, I think, to really get us to that tipping point was um, civic leadership. Really having Correct. the civic leaders stand up and say, our vision is this. We're going to back it with our minds, with our pocketbooks. And we're going to um, to back it for many, many years and and keep pushing it, keep molding it. And, um, you know, honestly, if it weren't for the private sector, and, I don't know where we'd be. That's started. And what people are doing, even the government, everybody joining together and doing the right thing to happen. And at this point, it's unstoppable, our yes. future. Yes. For us, our kids, our grandkids. Mm-hmm. It's not a go away place. No. It's a power place. Yeah. And we're all involved. I, I think so. You know, one of the things that I remember from our interview or, or the documentary with you was you had mentioned how you get resumes all the time. You get uh, El Paso ones that have really impressive resumes in there elsewhere, but they want to find ways to, to return or the opportunities. 
what are some of the some of the things El Paso needs to to amenize, so to speak, so that top talent can come here and, and I mean really bestow their brilliance upon yeah. the region? What 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 have you seen that needs to shift? And- well, I think we need to really put together um, a regional strategy for attracting certain corporate jobs here. We, we're um, fertilizing the startup world over at the Medical Center of the Americas in our incubator, which is great. You need startups, you need innovators, you need entrepreneurs, but that takes a while for any of those companies to hit, and it um, it, it takes a certain mass to, to transform a community. We need to pair that with some big corporate players coming in here, some, some people where we're not just a, a call center for, or a distribution center for, or a back office for. I think that we have the talent here to have larger research jobs, engineering jobs, corporate headquarters, professional um, units for big corporations here in El Paso. And until we get that, um, it's going to be hard for us to be able to have the interesting jobs to retain the talent that are currently leaving. So UTEP is graduating thousands of engineers every year that are highly talented and they're almost all, they almost all graduate with jobs, but they're not not in El Paso. And so if we could just have a company take a stake in El Paso and say, you know, I'm gonna take the next 2,000 mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, chemical engineers, and I'm just gonna hire them here to do something great, we'd have a phenomenal company here. So, you know, it's harder to move a workforce than anything else. You know, so we have that workforce. We're just not retaining it. So our brain drain has has stopped in a lot of ways. But in a in a lot of ways, I run into people that are grossly underemployed all the time. They're taking jobs because they don't want to leave. They people from El Paso love El Paso, want to be near their culture and their families. Um, but they're taking jobs that they should not be doing and taking wages that they should not um, be taking. But um, you know, so we still have our work to do. I think we've been doing the hard work to get us there. And we're at a point where we are interesting enough, we've developed enough that our strategy needs to evolve to start shooting a little bit higher. Part of the part of the problem has been the perception that, that the, the frontera that El Paso mm-hmm. and Juarez has. You know, it's the safest city in the country, one of them, mm-hmm. and it has been mm-hmm. awesome. But it's also sometimes shadowed by and the perception that people have of what is my perspective and, and the way I perceive creating content and story is how do I engage the layers of drama that are occurring here and, and to make them into a compelling narrative that that evokes and inspires, yeah. you know, people on, in direct and indirect ways. So, you know, I think the way we can bridge that is by, you know, dynamic storytelling and brand building so that you're able to control your narrative and present the ethos of who you are to the world. And I think a lot of people do see Juarez as our downfall because people are so fearful. But it's the, really the opposite. Yeah, it really the, is. Oh, my gosh. Part of our greatness. Sure. The, those of us who grew up here know that what makes El Paso so interesting is what we have in Juarez. Some of exactly. the best restaurants are in Juarez. Some of the best entertainment in the world. All of us grew up going dancing in Juarez, and it was safe, and it was fun. Um and I think that's why people still have an affinity. But the stories, the the films that sell are the violence. Yeah. And um, and I think if you were to try to find a storyline that talks about the job opportunity, the way that the jobs have evolved from um, from gene manufacturing to the factories that I'm working in today in Juarez that are they have some pretty advanced biomedical device manufacturing using the exact same talent, the tailors who are sewing jeans are now sewing aortic stents in Juarez. Um, Those are stories. Uh, Maybe I'm a big nerd or something, but I mean, I I walk into those places and it's fascinating. You're absolutely right. Let me tell you how important Juarez has been. A very close friend of mine, Jaime Bermudez, Mm -hmm. was very instrumental in opening the McKinley industry right in Juarez, which eventually was all over the country of Mexico. In the beginning, when I was a manufacturer's rep, not a manufacturer, repping companies out of New York and Southeast. And uh, I mean, knew about me and he called me and he said, um, I'd like to invite you to lunch 
that love forgot them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I, I knew pretty well who he was. He was well known, even at that point. And uh, we met and had lunch at La Fogata, and he said, I'd love for you to be involved with the uh, Michaela industry that was starting here in uh, northern Mexico. And he told me how it was being done. His, uh, his uncle was um, the head of Pemex, and the two of them got together. And what happened was the, uh, a lot of the labor, the Michaela setup, in, uh, that was going into the Panhandle, Lubbock, and all that area. They uh, were sending money back, and great workers, and doing job and helping the farmers. Mm -hmm. The landowners and the farmers loved them because they couldn't get enough of their own forests, and they were doing very well. And then a law was passed killing the Aquila program. Yeah. And we, Ricardo, Bermudez, and Jaime got together, and of course, the head of Pemex, it's one of the biggest jobs in the world, and uh, they got together and set up the Mequila, starting mm -hmm. in Juarez mm -hmm. with sowers. Mm -hmm. That's at the point that Jaime called me, and I said, I'm not there yet, but I'm starting a new company. When I'm ready, we'll mm -hmm. talk again. Mm -hmm. And we did talk, and the idea was unstoppable. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the talent and the ingenuity of the Mexican workers mm -hmm. and the middle managers, all of them I found great. And a lot of negatives about the Mexican government, everything went my, my, my way, <laughs> in every way, yeah. with Mexico City. And when they needed, quote, when I needed quota, after we built up our Bakila deal, I went to Mexico and we were getting quota, but then there, there was not enough for all the production we had. They said, Don Shapiro, we'd love to give you a quota. It's limited. I said, what can I do? And one of the big shots said, we know you're connected in many areas, including Washington. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to call LBJ and see if it could help. I called LBJ. <laughs> And Bobby is amazed. She goes, I get in the biggest names, companies or whatever, seems some way I get to talk to them and meet them. So I called LBJ, spoke to him for a second, and he said, I'm going to put you in touch with the head of the uh, chamber in Washington. So I flew up there, met the head guy. I said, here's the problem. We, uh, Mexico needs quota. What we're doing in Mexico is helping build more more jobs in El Paso. At the time, I had 850 employees in El Paso alone. I said, Mexico is helping us with the maquilas, and uh, they need quota. Let's talk about what we can do. We spent about two or three hours talking about it. He said, I'll see what we can do. Next day, he called me. In Mexico, had all the program they needed for the garment industries wow. to connect with us in Action West of El Paso. It was a positive all the way around, mm -hmm. both countries, yeah. and uh, nothing negative. Yes. So, so those are the kinds of stories that you know with a documentary that that we're con that we're presenting not only for El Paso and Juarez audiences, I think they're universal enough for you know, for international audiences. And I also want the younger generations to recognize that the reason why there is a city here that's growing and that's you know becoming more and more cosmopolitan is a result of 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 men like Don, of men like Jaime, you know, people like you know, women like your your mother and like yourself, you know, is it comes from generations of, of persistence and mm -hmm. building and creating. And one story, for example, I got to pitch to 
uh, an agent, a manager, a friend of ours, you mm -hmm. know, in, from El Paso, and uh, Ana Alicia was an actress on Falcon Crest back in the day. Oh, yeah. She won a few Emmys. She was in the Johnny Carson show a few times. And now she has an entertainment company where she focuses on Latino talent. And, mm -hmm. and she, you know, she's got some phenomenal contacts and, you know, works with Ron Howard's production company. And so she got to actually put us on a pitch with the New York Times op-ed series on border stories, right? I'm working with uh, a doctor, potentially... Uh, Dr. Uh, Alan Ross, who's from New York, he comes here uh, once, nine months out of the year, he comes here for 10 days at a time. He bought an apartment downtown. He goes to Juarez. He works at the university over there. I, I've met with Maker him. Space. He's doing uh, public yes. health. Yes. Uh, he's a public health for, from Columbia University. Yes. 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 So he's done that like in Bosnia and yes. in Egypt. And he wants to he's do that. He's trying to create economic opportunity for people because... Once you have economic opportunity, you can um, improve your health care. Yeah. yeah. So one of our projects uh, is, is I pitched that series mm -hmm. to, to the, you know, and the company that I was, I was talking to was they produced An Inconvenient Truth. And mm -hmm. so, you know, there were, these, are, these are some major players and, and they liked it, but it just wasn't the 10 minute format they were looking for. They're like, that's too extensive. That's like mm -hmm. a full documentary. Mm -hmm. And they were right. You know, so we're still going forward on that. And that's the kind of documentary project that I really clear away. You know, like like what I'm learning with Dawn is the vertical growth concept of business, right? Where sure. you control from, you build from the inside mm -hmm. out and you control all components of it. So with that being said, you know, we're building a business model so that I can demonstrate to myself, first and foremost, how... It can be done, and then, and then as a result, those around me can, you know, witness that, and and so we build our own model to where we build sustainability, where we can fund our own documentary projects such as that, and, and so those are the kinds of narratives that I want to build. I part the past, ultimately, what I would like for it to be to become like its own Netflix channel, yeah. you know, and and you leverage the geopolitical positioning of El Paso and Juarez mm -hmm. as as the the new the new you know path, so to speak, is is binary, it's digital, it's it's storytelling, it's narrative, it's information, you know, it's it's the biggest international border in the world. So mm -hmm. you leverage it as the as the <clears throat> the entrance, you know, to you know, to South and Central America and and, and, and it's it's a and it's an it's an advantage. It's not it's not a crutch. It's not an it's not an ailment, you know, mm -hmm. it's a point of empowerment. So it's all encompassing. Yeah. yeah. All of it. Yeah. Well something we've um noticed is that you know we talked a little bit about having a, a good environment and not buying people in and for our first 10 years or so of existence we were very internally facing and focused because we thought we had a lot of work to do to get our environment to a place where people would want to come um, you can't just say hey we're going to be a medical community and start advertising it when you can't even get a doctor yourself in town. So a lot of work um, had to be done. And a couple of years ago, we looked up and we said, wow, our community has done so much to fertilize this um, amazing new industry. And no one outside of El Paso knows about it. Right. So there's a, a, only so much that you can grow internally before you have to start making external uh, collaborations and partners and bringing in. And um, so we have tried to be much more externally focused over the last couple of years, going to conferences, telling our story, trying to post, um, you know, I'm not a social media person. I have an intern helping me with my LinkedIn account. That's about as sophisticated as it's going to get. But really trying to get the word out about what we're doing so we can bring more in. And so having vehicles like the Power of the Pass as a one tool for our community to use to get good messages out about our community told in a professional and creative way um, is really important so uh, kudos to you guys for starting this up and for creating a culture here that um, is going to bring a lot of empowerment to a lot of people absolutely absolutely it's great yeah and we're delighted to have you we're very fortunate for all the great work that you've done and that you're still doing mm -hmm. We well, appreciate you. Totally. I, I appreciate you from the time I was 10 years old, sitting in the heart car. You've been in my life. So thanks for all that you've done. You're an amazing mentor. So. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, you know, that, that'll go ahead and, you know, wrap up our, our first podcast. Thank you again, Emma Schwartz of the MCA, Don Shapiro, CEO of Power at the Pass, Richie Marufo, sound engineer. We'll go ahead and sign off. Thank you very much. Thank you all. 